guys, welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer Kickstarter board game review. Today's game up on the tabletop is by Ben Burns, and it is for two to five players. It's called Inner Sanctum. It's a cultist game in which you're going to be playing as cultists, and you'll be attempting to gather different influences like artifacts and spells and politics and cultists and so on and so forth. You'll have your character board that you'll have levels on here, and if you can get to the highest level before anybody else, you can win the game. However, it's going to all cost you something, and that is going to be corruption. No cultist wants too much corruption, though, because if they get too much, they're going to lose the game. And as you get more corruption, nasty stuff starts to happen to you. You can utilize corruption, though, in order to help you win the game, in essence. So it's kind of this teetering scaling effect. And you're going to be drawing cards and trying to obtain them into your hand, into what you're going to play during a certain phase of the game. Uh different sets of cards down face down then flipping them up and see who has the most of that specific card you know, then gain a level up point as well as gaining this little token which will allow you to use the special ability of that type first person to get to a uh, level six or seven i believe is going to be the winner the last interesting thing is you can actually turn the card over to sell your soul and for two turns you won't be able to uh, be, uh had cards played against you which may really help but selling your soul has a huge cost. Anyway, that's the basics ideas of the game, Inner Sanctum. Let's go ahead and take a look down below. I'll show you all the contents and then we'll talk about how to play. So here we have the game Inner Sanctum and everything that's included. And as you can see, you're going to get a big stack of cards here. You're going to get your player board along with this little token here, which is going to symbolize your level. And you're all going to start at level one for as many players as there are. And uh, you're going to go get reference cards. And they have a front and a back side. This is going to show your corruption tracker. And this is going to show the different uh, specific tokens you can gather through the game and the bonuses they give you when you play them. You have your tokens for selling your soul. Each player can sell their soul once. And the tokens that you're going to be utilizing um, as you collect sets. These are all corruption, and there's going to be fives, tens, ten, uh, fives, ones, tens, and twenties. A box for the game rules, and of course, the dark one. To begin the game, you're simply going to move the box aside and any players that are not playing, and then you're going to go ahead and put out the players that are. Give each player a reference token, and make sure you've got everybody marked at one to start with, and every other reference card is going to be removed. Uh, the corruption is going to be set aside as well. You won't be utilizing that until you need to and you do not necessarily want to you gain these because when you hit 35 corruption, you're going to lose the game. The objective is to hit level 7, and uh, you're going to be doing that by gather by this thing called the gathering phase. On your turn, you're simply going to just make sure you have this deck shuffled and uh, begin the game by giving everybody four cards. When they have their four cards, they're going to go ahead and look at their hand to make sure they got everything they need. Set aside the sell your soul tokens. You probably only need two for a two-player game, so you can move the rest over. And then you're going to take the dark one, and you're going to spin the dark one. And whoever it's pointing to, so it's pointing to this guy right here, is going to start the game. You won't need him. You can go ahead and set him aside, I guess, as the first player here. And then, uh, you, on your turn, you're going to go ahead and look at your hand, and then you're going to get to draw cards from the deck. You'll draw two cards from the deck just like that, and then you can play an action card. And there's a couple action cards in his hand, like Spell Counter. This cancels a spell and it costs you a corruption. And this one here says you can play uh, on another player and declare a spell or ritual, and they must discard all the cards of the chosen type. Now, these are things that are going to give you corruption, which you do not want to get, because they're going to slowly progressively make you uh, more unstable, uh, unstable, and it's going to cost you in the game. Um, in general, when you get 10 cards that you're in your hand at the start of a turn, you're going to en enact this gathering phase in which you're going to try and place down certain sets to gain tokens and levels. And of course, when you get more corruption, you're going to have to, you're going to do that uh, phase earlier and earlier on. So to begin your turn, you're going to go and choose to play an action if you want. So maybe I'll play magic, um, dispel magic. And this would actually, instead of going to the graveyard, like normally, I'd go in front of you. And the reason, I'll explain the reason for that in a second. Uh, now we'll go ahead and declare rituals. So he will check his hand to see if he has any rituals. And in fact, he does have one, so it will go and get discarded. And then this is going to go here, and he's going to gain one corruption. And after that, he can choose to keep the additional card he drew, or he can choose to discard. And if he chooses to keep the card he drew, which he will, it's going to cost him two corruption. Every time you keep the extra card, it's going to cost you two. So he gained two more corruption. In general, you're going to draw two and discard one. But if you want to, you can choose to at the cost of more corruption. Leave your hand aside here, and the next player is going to get to go. And you're always going to be checking at the beginning of a turn to see if they have ten cards 
uh, for the for the gathering phase, or if the corruption uh, on them is higher, it might be nine or even eight. So he's got his uh, scandal artifacts, so he can choose to draw one from the rituals, uh, one from this card and one from here, or he can draw two from here. So he'll go ahead and go one and two. He's got a ritual, so maybe he'll want that next time if it's going to be there. Then he can play an action card that says play another player. They must discard all artifact cards for a corruption, and he'll play that in front of him. He gains a corruption. He checks this, this, this player checks their hand for artifact cards. He doesn't have any, so he just kind of lost... Uh, he just gained a corruption for nothing. Too bad. And then he's going to go ahead and discard a card. Maybe he'll discard that ritual, actually, and keep the artifacts. And the next player is going to get to go, and he'll simply draw one. Oops, he'll draw one card here, and he'll go for one more as well. Uh, let's see what he's got. He's got uh, he's got the spell counter. He's got two spell counters. These are good to save. Maybe he'll go ahead and get rid of just one of them. And uh, continuing the game as is, drawing two more cards, artifacts. So he's got three artifacts. That's good. Uh, and a ritual card he probably doesn't need as well as a scandal. We'll go ahead and discard the scandal. And as you see, people, the players are slowly building their hand up and uh, choosing cards to keep and choosing cards to get rid of. A lot of spell counters this guy doesn't need, apparently. So eventually what's going to happen is the person uh, who begins the turn is going to have 10 cards in their hand. So we'll go ahead and just uh, give players additional cards to show that the game has progressed a little bit. And uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Perfect. So this guy will say it's not this guy's turn, in which case he has 10 cards in hand. Uh, he has 3 corruption, which means that he's going to start the gathering phase. They will then look at their hands, respectively, and put all the cards in order. And uh, if you have at least 3 of a certain type, you can go ahead and put them down face down. And does he have any more? He has a business and a business. That's not going to do it. Spells, spells... Not enough there. You can keep those. You discard your all your all your action cards because you're not going to be needing those. And uh, then this player would do the same thing as well. Does he have anything? He's got three artifacts right there. Mm, spells, spells, artifacts. You got the artifact there. And okay, so that'd be a good example. All right. After that happens, then we're just going to flip over politics and artifacts. And based on the number of cards you have from three and up, up to seven, you're going to be gaining certain amounts of corruption. The more you have, the more corruption you gain, up until seven, in which you're going to actually lose corruption. So having more is going to be beneficial to you for two reasons. The first thing is if he actually had four politics and he had three, he would gain the level up for politics specifically, and he would also uh, gain corruption based on uh, the number, the, uh, the four cards as opposed to three. Now, the lesser amount that you win with is going to give you less corruption. However, it's also less likely you're going to win uh, that level up for the turn. But in this case, he's going to stay at one. This player will gain one level for politics, and he'll also gain the politics token. And this player will gain one level for artifacts, and he will gain the artifacts token. And these tokens will do certain things on your turn. You can utilize them once, and it'll give you a benefit. So for instance, politics is place a played action card into your hand. Once somebody plays an action card, he can simply discard this card and take that action into their hand, uh, which is pretty useful. It can be very beneficial to the player. And obviously the way to win is getting to seven. Now you could also choose to play multiple sets, maybe artifacts and um, something like rituals or spells, in which case that would gain you more levels faster. And in a multiplayer game, you'd also be checking to see how many cards have been played. After that, you're going to be disc discarding down to four cards and based on your corruption, it says, um, you know, you can hold one less card at 10. You may only draw up to three cards as opposed to four on a round at 15. 20 says you have, you have to call it gathering and every have eight cards as opposed to nine which is at five and ten which is at less than five and finally 25 is uh, when gathering is called give a random card to the cultist with the least corruption and the and less than 20 corruption wow that's that's pretty pretty good <laughs> so uh, uh this game's gonna continue like that until somebody gets to seven the other way it could end is if every player other than one person hits 30 five corruption in which case they will be basically gone insane and uh, they will lose the game so that is the basic idea players are then going to go ahead and discard all the cards that they played and you shuffle it up and start again playing once again for the next round trying to get to that coveted level seven for the game inner sanctum so before we get started with explaining what I think about the game, I want to talk about a couple other little caveats, such as selling your soul and calling the Dark One, two very important things to do as a cultist. When you choose to sell your soul, it's a one-time deal, and you're going to be actually taking your little board here and flipping it over to the evil red side. This side is actually going to allow you to have two turns of no actions being played against you, or two, yeah, two turns of no actions being played against you, or two rounds. And you're going to switch the level from one side to the other, so if you're at level two, you go to level two just like that. And also you get to draw five cards and you play it, but you can only do it once, and after that, the Sell Your Soul card becomes a dead card, and you can't use it anymore. 
Uh, if you want to, if you're in really far behind, you can go ahead and choose to call the dark one. The way you do that is by having one of each of the different types of uh, different categories of card in your hand and playing this card. When you do that, you can then take one of these coins here and flip it over. If you get heads three times in a row, you win the game instantly. If you don't, which is very likely, you're going to gain 20 corruption and likely die. It's one of those things where if you're just too far behind, it might let you have the ability to sneak right up there again and catch up. Otherwise, though, that's basically how you play the game. There's quite a few different action cards in the deck, and for the most part, you're going to be doing things like picking a player, naming a card, making them either discard it or take it, or making them discard all cards of a specific type, like Religious Crusade gets rid of all cultists, and uh, the Hostile Takeover makes you uh, draw a random card from their hand, and the Raiders is all discard all artifact cards. Raiders of the Lost something or other, right? And that's the basic idea of the game. So, first of all, what do I think about it? Well, the artwork is pretty cool. I like the style of cultist. I like the Cthulhu-ish -ish genre. It's more of a cultist genre. It could be kind of anything. And where you're just trying to, uh, trying to uh, gain as much power as possible, because that's what's important in the game. It has this kind of hand management thing that's going on, making sure that players do not know what's in your hand, because if they do, they're going to play action cards that make you lose everything in your hand. It's going to be very, very costly for you, and somewhat costly for them. Another thing to note is, almost everything you do, you do, and you do in the game is going to cost you corruption. The only thing that you're not going to, be, you're going to be able to do that doesn't cost you corruption is simply drawing two and discarding one and doing nothing else until the, the gathering phase. But that's going to keep you slowly progressing as opposed to more quickly. If you want to try and sell your soul, you might push ahead for a while. The cost of having to suffer the corruption negative effects throughout the rounds. Sometimes it's better to play cards a little later than it is to play them sooner. So I do like the aspect of the game. It has different mechanics going for it. It has the different phases of the game, which is the drawing phase, which feels very smooth and simplistic. And the options to sell your soul and call in the Dark One are nice. Uh, at the cost of this calling the Dark One card is like, you must be in dead last to want to go for this because it is near impossible. Flipping three coins and getting heads three times in a row is almost never going to happen, right? And then selling your soul is cool. I like the fact that you flip over your board and at the fact that you're going to actually be gaining something to do so, but at the cost of taking a boatload of corruption and not being able to utilize it anymore. And most cultists are probably going to sell their soul to the Dark One at some point or another in the game, at the cost of gaining more power. Another interesting thing is, with a two-player game, it's it's okay with a two-player game. You're going to be simply trying to place down the stacks as fast as you possibly can, make sure you don't show your opponent, and get to level 7, uh, utilizing the tokens, which also give you some unique abilities. With a multiple-player game, though, that's when it comes more interesting, because then you're going to have a player with three politics, someone with four, and someone with five. The one with five is going to get the level up, but they're also going to get a boatload of corruption because they chose to play five as opposed to four. You can choose to play as many as you want, but you have to be the highest person in that category to win in order to gain that level until you get to seven, which is where you're going to lose corruption. But getting to seven is near impossible because players are going to be playing cards on you to make you discard cards or discard all politics cards, and oh wait, you only have seven in your hand. That can be devastating in this game. It has a little bit of a take that mechanic, so if you don't like take that games, you might still like this game, if provided you like hand management, and provided you don't mind the fact that you're kind of uh, controlling only so much as to what information gets in and gets out, because there can still be players that are very, very savvy and have good memories uh, that can get you pretty easily. It's a simplistic little card game that works really well, I think, with three, four, and, three, four, and even five players. Uh, the two-player variant was, was fine. Um, a couple of little caveats that were like, for me, selling your soul for some reason after you after you do it, it's just a dead card. I would kind of prefer if both of these cards just let you simply discard them and draw a new card as opposed to for everybody as opposed to them just being cards you discard. But at the same time, I can see the fact that you sold your soul that after you've done that, the card is now a dead card as opposed to having the option. But either way, I think you could have, you could change that around if you wanted to. All the action cards work, and the game's simply straightforward and uh, a fun little enjoyable card game. I do like the theme of it. I, I'd like to see more artwork, I suppose. Uh, the cards definitely could use a fix-up. It looks like there's a lot of just icons and stuff like that on it. They're fine. They're not 
awful or anything like that. Probably even more of the same style cultist artwork. Uh, full bordered card would be more uh, interesting. And of course, the pieces uh, probably a little more spruced up. This is a prototype, so I'm not going to comment too much on all that because who knows what it's going to look like when it's all done. That's up to you to check it out in the Kickstarter. Down below in the description, if it finds if you find like this something interesting to you. Overall, it's a solid little game that if you find the theme interesting, hand management, and the fact that it has a little take that, you should definitely check out the game Inner Sanctum by Ben Burns. Down below, thanks for watching.